if we're looking at a pie chart, everybody acts like nutrition is 50% of it. And it's just not, it's like, it's a small slice of the pie. And then there's other small slices of the pie. <laughs> Welcome to another exciting edition of Talking Retirement. We have an amazing episode for you today. We are here with Rachel Haverson, who is a diabetes educator and care specialist. She's also a nurse, and she has an amazing page where she talks about all things diabetes education and care management. And she really is here to help destigmatize diabetes and make sure people have the resources they need to manage diabetes and live a long and healthy life. So without further ado, we have diabetes coach, Rachel Halverson. How are you doing today, Rachel? Hey, I'm doing good. I appreciate the the hype. Yeah, got to hype you up. You do good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so before we dive into all the different topics we're going to be talking about, I'd love to know a little bit more about you and your story and how you, you know, became a nurse, ended up becoming a diabetes care specialist. Like, what was your journey leading to this moment? Yeah, so I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when I was five years old. And I was on a camping trip, was chugging a bunch of Mountain Dew, and they were like, something is up with Rachel. <laughs> you get her checked out. So well, it's, um, it's like chugging the Mountain Dew, like something else was happening. <laughs> it was like a lot of Mountain Dew. Um, so they, uh, yeah, so that's when I was diagnosed sometime in the summer. I don't actually have a diversary, which is really sad. Everybody has like, they remember what date it was, but it was so long ago. I don't, I don't even remember. So I grew up with it. Um, and it was kind of interesting. So I've seen a lot of diabetes technology and medications have changed so much in the 26 years that I've had diabetes. Um, so I, I feel like I have some good insight into to how things were, you know, I was using NPH and regular insulin, which we don't use very often anymore. Uh, no CGMs, no, the insulin pumps were not quite as advanced and mainstream. So I really grew up getting to like test out all of these things. And um, I became a nurse and a diabetes specialist, mostly because I originally, I knew I wanted to become a freelance cellist, a classically trained cellist. And my mom said to me, because she's a smart lady, she said, you can do that, but you need to also get a degree in something else so you can get health insurance because you have diabetes. So um, All right. <laughs> I, so for many years, I knew like I was going to go to music school and I was going to go to nursing school. Like that was exactly what I knew I was going to do. And so I, and honestly, I didn't know that much about nursing. I thought it was going to be a really easy job. Um, so that was a surprise when I, <laughs> I took it into it. And um, and I think a lot of us gravitate, like as nurses, we gravitate towards the diabetes part of things. When we have diabetes ourselves, a lot of the educators and specialists you see probably have diabetes or have family members with diabetes. I was really resistant to it at first, mostly because like people just kept telling me I should do it and I was being obstinate. But eventually I caved and I was like, I started working with more people with diabetes and just decided I really enjoyed it because there's a lot of as we know, misinformation out there. There's a lot of shame with diabetes. So I felt like I could really make a difference in people's lives. And I knew exactly kind of what I lacked when I was growing up with diabetes and when I was first diagnosed and throughout all those years. So I felt like I could give people more of what they needed um, and, and just, yeah, feel a lot more fulfilled. So that was, yeah, that's how I got there. And then I started during the pandemic, we were furloughed and I had a lot of time on my hands. So I, that's when I started a, a private practice online called Give Me Some Sugar. And that's where I do a lot of my social media on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, um, give out information that way, as well as diabetes self-management sessions uh, via my online practice and then courses and other products that people might need to learn more about how to live with diabetes. That's awesome, man. That's cool. I like how the whole pursuit starts with you just need health insurance. And like, that's kind of like everything else leads to that, you know, like, your parents are like, No, what we need first is health insurance before anything else. And I also am a musician and my dad at one point sat me down and probably had a very similar talk and was like, if you want to do music, go for it. But 
also graduate college. <laughs> like it's pretty important. Um, but so what do you do yep. with your private practice? Like what kind of stuff, you know, you mentioned the social media, but so let's say I'm a prospective client, someone who's looking to do some one-on-one -on -one diabetic coaching. What does your private practice do? Like what exactly on the actual private practice side, what exactly do you do for your clients? I get a lot of questions about like, what is the difference between like, why do I need you if I have an endocrinologist or a primary care provider? And the CDCES, which is a certified diabetes care and education specialist, is typically somebody that works alongside the doctors and is the subject matter expert in diabetes. So oftentimes endocrinologists and primary care providers come to consult us about, you know, best, best practice and, and what to do with uh, clients and that sort of thing. So while an endocrinologist or your primary care provider is very important to have to manage your medications and get your labs and do all of that good stuff and provide some education, the CDCES is the person that shows you how to live with diabetes and fit it into your life and give you all of those pieces that it's not just nutrition. There's there's a lot of information about how to take your medication, how to make it easier to take them, um, as well as different things about, we talk a lot about joyful movement and I, I hate exercise. So I, <laughs> I can like at least, again, help you work through and problem solve how to fit diabetes into your life so that it's less of a burden on you is, is my goal. So in our sessions, that's usually we, I meet, people where they're at, we talk about what they want to talk about. And, um, you know, whether that's going back to basics or optimizing their medications, or, you know, just talking more about balancing meals and all that good stuff. So it's, yeah, it's the, the how to diabetes portion of things. <laughs> that's awesome. And uh, I know you mentioned when we first got started, one of the reasons you got into it was like, due to the misinformation and stigmas, a lot of people with diabetes have to deal with what are some common, you know, misinformation tropes you see within, you know, the diabetic community? Like, what are some things that you have to put your hand up and say, that's not true at all. Let's reset expectations about what's going on. My biggest one forever and always is going to be, especially in the type two world is going to be that, like you did this to yourself. This is preventable a hundred percent, that kind of vibe. Um, type one, thankfully is a little bit less likely to get that kind of stigma. Um, although there there still are instances where people feel like, you know, you you did this somehow to yourself. But um, especially with my my type two patients, I see that a lot. And it's just so wrong. And it gets internalized. And it just makes your life a lot harder when you're feeling that way, too. And it just, it's almost liberating when you find out that it's like not your fault and there yeah. you know it it sucks to know that there wasn't maybe a lot you could do about it but also like you know you got to be gentle with yourself and uh so yeah that's that's my biggest one uh majority there's just so many different factors that go into any type of diabetes diagnosis it's never ever been anybody's fault and uh a lot of the times could not really be prevented so that's that's my my biggest one but of course there's a ton of <laughs> ton of misinformation for all types of diabetes about diet especially um like do i have to cut out multiple food groups i'm not allowed to have carbs i'm not allowed to have sugar or enjoy my life anymore so those those are things i spend a lot of time talking it's interesting i talk people down a lot so people often come to me i thought i would be maybe working with people in a way where i'm like trying to promote more health supportive behaviors. And I actually find that I'm trying to talk people down from some of the things they're doing. So they, you know, maybe they cut out all carbohydrates, they're intermittent fasting, um, and, and things like that. And I'm like, you know, let's, if you're okay doing that, that's cool, but it's also not necessary. So, um, there's, yeah. it's just kind of this, this, uh, thing that's attached to diabetes that we see in, uh, the media and and all of it, and our doctors often tell us to do as well. So, um, yeah, definitely, there's a lot of that diet culture, and then also just where diabetes comes from and the pathophysiology of it. It's almost like you have to deprogram people because they've just you know gotten so yeah. much hand information online from like fitness influencers and everything like that. Mm -hmm. They're like, 
oh, I got to do this. I got to do that. And it's funny because like I'm big into fitness myself and I see a lot of these fitness influencers and I'm like, those guys are eating oats. Those guys are eating pancakes. Those yeah. guys are eating sugar and they're running like 20 miles. So this whole idea that you can't eat carbs or sugar, like it just doesn't hold up in any sense, right? Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest things I see with you and a bunch of other uh, diabetes educators I see online is you guys talk about how important carbs are to managing your diabetes. So like, how do you kind of deprogram someone who says, Oh, I need keto, I need intermittent fasting, like, how do you reinsert carbs into a healthy capacity into their lives? Well, first of all, we have to understand that carbohydrates are your body's source of energy. So that's why a lot of the time, at least when you're first diagnosed with diabetes, or if you cut out all carbs, you may notice that you're really fatigued. You don't feel like exercising because you're so stankin' tired. Maybe you're craving carbs and and like very high uh, density calories and things like that. And that's just because your body is not getting what it needs to function. In fact, your brain can only utilize carbohydrates. Um, so it kind of gives you that brain fog. And everybody like acts like it's so normal, like it's a keto flu or something. <laughs> Which is just wild to me, but it's really just that your brain is starving for energy. It's, so it's that's, in, that's important. I got to say one thing, like when we sign people up for Medicare plans, a lot of times, like one of the things they look for is like, have you been through ketosis? But you see like YouTube influencers yeah. who are like, oh, you're just going through ketosis. It's no big deal. I'm like, that's a big deal. Like, that's not something you should be going through regularly. <laughs> like, it's not good by any means. Yeah. You know? Exactly. It's the it's the second like source. It's it's like a backup plan for your body is ketosis. So it's not something your body wants to do. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> want to break down fat for energy. So let's not force it. So um yeah, just understanding that carbohydrates are a very important part of everybody's diet and we do need them. When you have diabetes though, it is a metabolic disorder where we just can't process the glucose properly. So we have to figure out how to get that glucose processed. And a lot of the time that's through medication. Basically, insulin acts like a little key and it goes into the cells and it allows the glucose to get into the cell. When you have type 1 diabetes, you no longer have any keys and we got to put them into you manually. When you have type 2 diabetes, then it's like somebody changed the lock, but didn't change the key. So that's kind of what's going on. So it's a little bit different of a mechanism, but it results in the same kind of thing. And so we use medications to help you process those carbohydrates. You can, if you choose to lower the amount of carbohydrates, you absolutely can do that as long as you're keeping, you know, a moderate amount in your, in your diet, then that chill. Um, I think of it like a, a thermostat. So let's say we've got your medications all optimized, you're feeling good, but you're noticing you're still having really significant blood sugar rises after meals and it just sticks up there and it's really frustrating. So I tell everybody it's like a thermostat. So the set point <laughs> in the thermostat, whenever it gets above the temperature, the, you know, the furnace shuts off, right? Same thing. We can think of it like when it gets above a certain point in this threshold, your insulin is going to shut off. So let's say your threshold, which is a very personal thing, is 45 grams of carbs. If you eat 45 grams of carbs, then it's going to rise and it's going to hit that and it's going to come right back down because the insulin is always doing its thing and it's flowing. Um, so you'll you'll see little bumps and things like that, but it will generally come back down pretty pretty easily. If your threshold, if you go above it, then your insulin shuts off and it just hangs out. And then when you want to eat again, you're going to get another excursion and it's just sort of going to do this like staircase sort of thing. So our goal usually is how can we raise and, and lower this threshold, whether that's with medication, if you exercise a little bit more, it'll raise and you can eat more carbohydrate. Um, if you're stressed out for that day, it's going to lower. So you may need a little bit less carbohydrate. Um, so uh, stress management, making sure you're getting sleep, all of those things are going to keep that nice and high so that you can eat the food that you need to eat. I like that. It's a more holistic view. It's not, hey, here's one medicine 
deal with it. It's like, how do I plan mm-hmm. on my meals? How do I take my medication? How do I manage my stress yeah. level? How do I like live a more active lifestyle? It seems like there's so many components to living a healthy lifestyle of diabetes. It's it, it, there's no one size fits all situation for anybody, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we all we all have different numbers and and things that we can do. And I actually I think about this all the time. So I um, went to uh, visit a friend recently, and she also has type one diabetes. We went to a hotel together and just had some fun. And then they had continental breakfast and there were Belgian waffles, which we are a huge fan of. So we both went, made our Belgian waffles, same thing, same batter. She gave herself insulin for 88 grams of carbohydrates. I gave myself insulin for 55 grams of carbohydrates because that's just what we were I just knew that's what worked for me and she knew that's what worked for her. And we both stayed steady. So it's not that that waffle had like a varying amount of carbs in it necessarily. It was just that we we knew what worked for our body and we had that intuition and done all that practice. It's a lot of trial and error, but you can see like our bodies are just so different and, and respond to like different amounts of medication and all that good stuff. So that's perfect. And so once you find out what your numbers are, it's kind of just like second nature. You're not yeah. really thinking about what you're doing. Yeah, definitely. So kind of going back to the misconceptions, something you said earlier that really resonated with me is a lot of people think type two diabetes is something you self inflicted and that, you know, you through proper, I mean, through improper diet and exercise, you made yourself overweight and you brought up your blood sugars and everything. What do you say to people who say that to you? Like, is it really just genetic things that lead you to potentially be type two diabetic? Is that what you're looking at more? It's a lot, very much so genetics. Uh, I think 30 for 30 to 40% of people's insulin resistance comes from their genes. And then, so that's a pretty large portion of it. Um, the rest, a lot of the time, I don't think we consider stress enough. A lot of the people I see getting diagnosed with diabetes are actually often healthcare workers because we're working night shift. <laughs> we're very stressed out. Yeah. And then there's this idea that America, you know, we're seeing more diabetes and like it's because we're all fat and blah, blah. No, it's because we're all working constantly and very stressed out. Um, there's no time to take care of yourself. And so we have all these cortisol levels rising and all these other hormones that are out of flux. And you can also get into possible endocrine em, endocrine disruptors, like in, in microplastics and shenanigans that we have absolutely no control over, um, could also play an effect in even triggering type one, but also maybe promoting some insulin resistance. Um, medications also, if somebody is taking steroids for another uh, disease, um, psych- psychiatric medica- med- medications a lot of the time um, cause a lot of insulin resistance and can lead to type 2 diabetes. Um, and none of those are your fault at all. Like you're just trying to, to take care of yourself, get through life, you know. Um, and of course, there's a little bit of a, a nutrition component to it. And if you are a little bit more sedentary, it's going to definitely make things a little bit worse. But if we're looking at a pie chart, everybody acts like nutrition is 50% of it. And it's just not. It's like, it's a small slice of the pie. And then there's other small slices of the pie. <laughs> um, so it's that's something to, I usually try to help people. It's just it's not all based off of food or things that were really within your control. And even those things that maybe you consider are within your control, maybe you don't have access to foods that are a little bit more health supportive. Maybe you don't have the time to meal prep and you really do have to eat out more often. That's not necessarily with, that's not like a willpower thing or anything like that. So I think it's it's just totally ridiculous to blame anybody for it because there's just so many different factors that go into it and so many things that just aren't within our control. I remember seeing this TED talk where this guy, Peter Atia, who's like a nutrition surgeon guy, talked about how he's a surgeon and he had to amputate somebody's leg due to diabetes. And at the time, he mm-hmm. had a lot of disdain for this person and was like, how did this person let themselves go? And he talked about, I was a surgeon, I was working out like two hours a day eating healthy. And fast forward two years, I was pre-diabetic. And Mm -hmm. he's like, and he said a a light bulb clicked off and he started crying because he was like, I can't believe I ever treated that person that way. 
And he's like, there's so much more to it than we want to give credit for. He's like, I was the poster child of health and working out and all that. And it still happens to me. And I think not enough people understand all the factors that you mentioned, because it could happen to anybody at any time. And it couldn't be due to just eating too many Big Macs or something like that, you know? So obviously, diet isn't the only portion. But obviously, there are issues with the American diet that go beyond diabetes. But you know, what are some factors of the typical American diet that can potentially contribute to diabetes and that kind of thing? Well, there's a lot of issue with it's not necessarily the carbs um, there. And this is nutrition science is very, very mixed up because it's hard to do. We're really only looking at correlation. And, and sometimes that's not like the best way to look at stuff because you can't really run a double blind trial with broccoli because people are going to notice when they don't have the broccoli in the placebo group, you know, so it's hard to do um, nutrition science because of that. So I always tell everybody just take this with like a, a grain of salt pun intended and like just you know consider that so there's a lot of uh research that shows us that very very high fat diets lots of saturated fat it does cause some insulin resistance in the body so that would be something i would consider you know if you are eating fast food quite frequently it does have a lot of saturated fat um and then lack of fiber so that's really the biggest issue. A lot of people are not eating maybe enough vegetables or or uh, grains or beans or things like that that are high in fiber. Um, again, sometimes because we don't have access or because they're just hard to like, nobody wants to cook grains and beans. It takes forever. So, um, but that fiber is very important for decreasing inflammation in the body. So type two diabetes, there's, there's a lot of inflammation and there's a lot of, insulin resistance. So it's kind of, that's really how maybe an, an American diet, standard American diet could potentially really aggravate some of that insulin resistance and, and possibly kind of get you, get you to that diagnosis a little bit faster. So it tends to be like high fat, low fiber. Those are kind of some things you should look out for. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I guess there's some, you know, everybody's like, oh, the, oh, the added sugar. And I just, because we do see cultures and things like that, where we don't see a large incidence of diabetes. Like if I'm looking at like Japan or something, um, you know, Okinawa, they did a lot of studies on, right? And that's a heavily starch based diet. They eat a lot of carbs, a lot of sweet potatoes, and very low fat. And it could also just be that that diet works for their body. And that's why we don't see it. It's similar to like, I don't know if I have a lot of Nordic blood, right? Like I should probably be eating fish and Brussels sprouts on the regular. Um, <laughs> so there's, there's some of that as a theory as well. Like maybe just based off of our bodies, we, we do have a certain way that we need to eat. And I think that's why I promote the like mindfulness you know, you, you know, what feels good and what tastes good. And some people like to eat more meat than others do. And, and that sort of thing. So just really listening to what, what makes you feel your best and, and trying to include protein and fiber and carbs and in, in all of it as much as possible. Yeah. Like eating healthy, but having fun at the same time. Yeah. Like you should still eat cake. It's balanced. <laughs> it's got fat and carbs. So Pizza, protein, <laughs> fat, carbs, you know, the whole thing. You're good to go. Yeah. Like just not every day, ideally. But I always, I think it's interesting. Like if I eat a donut, my blood sugar stays fairly steady. Like a Dunkin' Donut has 38 grams of carbs in it, which isn't insanely high. For a lot of people, that's what we recommend for a serving, right? And then, it, and it's got fat in there. So <laughs> not from, but you, you may not see your blood sugar rise from that. So that's why it's important to always keep in mind, like, just because I see my blood sugar do something or something may make me a little bit more insulin resistant doesn't necessarily mean that it's a quote unquote bad food. Yeah. I mean, a donut's like 300 calories. As long as you don't eat like the whole dozen, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, it's what it is. Just eat more donuts. <laughs> yeah. We obviously talked about all these misconceptions about diabetes, which is awesome. But I really want to dive into the prescription side of things, because I know that's something we talked about initially, you know, not only the medication for diabetes, but the fact that medication for diabetes is 
in many cases, so expensive, it's inaccessible. Um, so I'd kind of want to get your take on, you know, why is insulin so inspe- expensive for everybody but seniors? You know, why is Farsiga and Janimet and all these new prescriptions so unbelievably expensive or even like Wagovi and Ozempic, which can be $1,500 a month in some cases, like this is obviously life-saving medication that's needed. Why is it so expensive for the average person? Diabetes medications are very special in that they don't have generics. So um, there is, you know, some of the uh, sulfonylureas, which are like glipizide or glutaride, um, those are really old, so they do have generics. But these newer medications, uh, basically the drug companies have a patent and this is true for insulin too. They have a patent on this medication and it expires in a certain amount of time, but the drug company can put a little additive into it and renew the the patent. So so nobody can get in there and make a generic version of it or another version of it. And the other issue is, of course, that there is no, especially in the United States, there's no regulation on the drug companies and the cost of the medication. So the government could and should step in and <laughs> and and get those those prices lowered. Um, it is very very easy for them to make a profit off. If we like look at insulin, right? It costs four dollars to manufacture a vial of insulin, but they're selling it for three hundred dollars a vial. So even if we bumped it down to what they said they were going to bump it down to was $35, they're still making a significant profit off of this, this yeah. medication that honestly they should not be making a profit out of. But if that's if that's your concern, um, then, you know, the companies will be okay. They'll survive. Uh, similarly, the like, like government has also subsidized. <laughs> subsidized the um, medication. So in... Uh, like Canada or Europe or or those countries where people are able to get a lot of their medications for an affordable and reasonable copay, um, if there is a copay, it's uh, because the government is subsidizing and working with the drug company to get it to a point where they can provide it to their citizens for a reasonable price. So yes, in the United States, they're very expensive because the drug companies can just do whatever they want, and there is no regulation on the cost and no option for you to get a generic, so there's no competition. It's essentially a monopoly. Um, That's also why you see shortages like with the Ozempic and the Manjaro now is because it's just owned by one company, and they have just like one little factory. And Something happened. um, Yeah. Yeah, and it's dangerous. I have, I mean, if if you have people with diabetes listening, you know, they probably do not have their Ozempic, and it is not because there there is some issues, of course, with people prescribing it off label, and that that is problematic. But it really, the drug companies kind of pitting us against each other in that sense. It really comes down to them just not having, not being able to to uh, keep up with the demand. Yeah, no, it's interesting, because I think one of the things we talked about one time was how the guy who created insulin wanted it to be free. He said, this will be a game changer. It's free mm-hmm. in Canada. I think he was Canadian. And yep. when the patent came out, we gave it to Eli Lilly. And they were like, fingers crossed, we'll do our best. And then they turn around like a day later and make it $300 a month. It's just absurd to see. It's honestly disgusting. Like, it makes me so... And it's like, I didn't know about it until I became a nurse. And I was like, why none of my patients can get any of their medications. This is wild. And then I started to kind of learn more about, because a lot of the diabetes foundations and things like that, there's a lot of, um, they may not talk about that issue as much um, because they often get get some money um, to, to stay afloat from said drug companies. And so it it just wasn't something I knew about. But yeah, the, the fact that this was supposed to be free because people need it to survive and live. Every type of person with diabetes needs access to insulin. I think we we always, unfortunately, type ones are really bad about like being like, it's desperate, we'll die in like 10 seconds, which is true. But people with type 2 diabetes will still get hurt without their insulin as well. It's just a slower and terrible process. So I think that's why I'm I'm like trying to like, 
agitate and, and get everybody to get there because we do, we need access to the insulin as well as these other medications too, like the GLP ones and the SGLP twos. So we just have to get extra mad about it and, you know, throw a fit. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's interesting. Cause, uh, you know, luckily for seniors, it's capped at $35 a month, which was a big step forward. Yeah. It wasn't for the general mm -hmm. population, which is BS. I, I don't know why they didn't add that into the package. I mean, I know why. Yeah. We all know why. We can all say like, why did that happen? We know why. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting you brought up the shortages because I remember I had a client who couldn't get her Ozempic and she was living in South Jersey and she was about to drive up to Staten Island to get like yeah. the last Ozempic that they had. And even that was a toss up. And, you know, I see this with, you know, Ozempic and ADD medications, when you're on a medication, your body normalizes to that. And if you suddenly take mm -hmm. it away, it could be at best, really an inconvenience that could sidetrack your life. And at worst, it could be fatal. Like this yeah. is not something we should mess around with in any capacity. Yeah, no, it, it should be something we're like rioting about because it is so ridiculous because it's, it's like, Again, I have, all of my patients are just hanging out in the two, three hundreds without their medication, obviously. And, and like, no, it's like, where's the red alert? And, and so, and because it's, you know, they're not dropping dead or anything, but it's causing damage and it's making them feel awful. And it's just so ridiculous that, you know, we're just like, oh, when, when you do see media coverage of it, it's like, it's kind of, well, it's a weight loss drug and. And people are taking it for weight loss, and but nobody really mentions the people with diabetes that are seriously suffering from it. So, yeah, exactly. I think we even had a post about that where I had read about it, but then you know you backtrack and you go, wait a minute, it's more complicated than this. It's not just rich people buying everything up. You yeah, know? exactly. There's not enough rich people to really collapse the, <laughs> the supply <laughs> like that. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, so speaking of Ozempic and Wagovi, these are you know, two of the biggest things I see pop up whenever we post about what we'll go via Ozempic, you know, people always start fighting in the comments. It seems like a very controversial subject. As a diabetes educator, what can you tell us about Ozempic and what we'll you know, how it helps your patients and everything like that? Because I think there is so much misinformation. I'll admit I've fallen for it at times. But you know, what is the real purpose of these? And why are people so upset about them all the time? So I am a weight neutral practitioner. I generally do not, I do not harp on people's weight. It is again, something that is largely out of our control. And another thing to consider is that diabetes or weight gain is a symptom of type two diabetes and sometimes type one diabetes, just because insulin and all of these hormones getting messed up can just, it just makes it difficult. So it does not necessarily mean that the the adiposicity itself is the cause of everybody's issues right. here. Um, so the fact that we advertise Ozempic and Wagovi or prescribe them for people with diabetes to lose weight is problematic because A, if the person isn't losing weight, they're going to feel really awful about it and upset. Um, and then B, they may stop taking it because they're like, where's my weight loss? Um, when it's doing so much more than that. With both types of diabetes to certain uh, degrees, but especially in type 2 diabetes, you have GLP-1 resistance. And this is another hormone that is thrown out of whack when you have insulin resistance as well. So that's why we need so many different medications. Oftentimes we need the metformin for a certain purpose. We need the insulin for a certain purpose. We need the GLP-1 for this purpose. Because we're resistant to GLP-1, we're going to add that in. And what GLP-1 does is it helps to keep your stomach from releasing the food too quickly, which can help regulate your blood sugar. More importantly, it really helps with the elephant in the room when it comes to type 2 and type 1 diabetes, and that is the liver. The liver is doing all kinds of crazy stuff and it is it needs to calm down. So liver, for whatever reason, we're not even entirely sure why it happens, but after meals in anybody with diabetes, the liver decides to dump glucose into the bloodstream. And that obviously is going to make our blood sugar a lot higher than it needs to be. So that's really one of the biggest issues with diabetes and post 
prandial excursions like that. So the GLP-1 helps to, it tells the liver to quit it and not do that because it's inappropriate. So that is the biggest um, use of the GLP-1s like Ozempic, Trulicity, Manjaro, and Victoza, and Revelsis. And um, the weight loss may or may not happen because it is helping a little bit with some of that insulin resistance. It's also keeping your postprandial blood sugars from going up as high, which means you may use a little bit less insulin, which results in a little bit of weight loss. Um, again, just because you're you're less resistant. So that's what I try to tell people. The biggest issue we see is people are losing their appetite completely and losing weight that way. And that is not ideal. That's similar to starving yourself. And unfortunately, you really have to advocate with the doctor. Like, cause I've, I've asked patients, I'm like, yeah, you're eating 500 calories a day. Have you told your doctor? And they usually have. And the doctors are just like, well, you're losing weight. So it's great. That is not the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> we want to lose weight in a way that is is sustainable and you know eating very very low calorie like that because you lost your appetite it is a side effect that we we don't we want to adjust the medication so that you're not having that side effect um it should not completely wipe your appetite if anything it should just make it a little less you're less ravenous because um, diabetes can make you really hungry because we talked about that you need, need some <laughs> carbohydrates so um yeah Definitely. That is not, people think that's the point of Ozempic and Manjaro, but it is, it is a side effect we don't want. Um, so if that's something you're experiencing, you should definitely be like, Hey, we need a lower fist dose or try something different. Gotcha. So basically it's one of those things where it's like, it's made in earnest to help diabetics. And then people are like, Oh, it'll make you starve yourself. And it kind of becomes this big yeah. thing. Like it is a medication induced eating disorder. So like, it's, it's just crazy. Like, we're giving people this med and we're totally okay with them starving themselves because it's a medication, which is just wild to me. And um, yeah. And the other thing to consider too, is these GLP ones, you have to stay on them forever um, for as long as you have diabetes. Some people may be able to come off of it possibly. Um, but most of the time we need to stay on them. We do have some trials that show similar to any type of weight loss. If you go past five years and you stop using the medication or you stop doing what you're doing, you will gain that weight back and then some more. So again, it's a, it's a hormone that you're missing or you're not, uh, producing well, and we have to replace it. So that's really just the way to think about it. It doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong or it's a temporary fix. It's just something we have to replace because your body needs it. Gotcha. And while we're on the topic of prescriptions, something we wanted to ask you, and we, we say this with the preface that we are not doctors or medical professionals like yourself, but something we see a lot because we manage people's prescriptions and their costs and everything is we see people, you know, become pre-diabetic, become diabetic, and all of a sudden they are on Janimet and Farsiga and Victoza and all these very expensive medications right off the bat. Do you ever feel like there's an yeah. over prescription of these newer medications when you could potentially start with something cheaper like metformin or glipizide and, you know, maybe manage with that before you actually dive into these $500 a month medications? Absolutely. There's, I've been on both sides of, of things. I, I used to work with an insurance company where we tried to keep people from getting over medicated, which is a very common issue. Um, and a lot of that stems from not seeing an educator or a specialist, you know, that the doctor is doing what the algorithm tells them. But a lot of the time they miss the part of, you know, working with the patient, like, is this something we can change with our diet? Are you super stressed? Like what's going on? Are you depressed? Do we need to try something, you know, in the, in the psych realm there before we add on more medication? Um, so yeah, usually definitely um, starting with metformin and then seeing an educator is going to really help keep costs down because then we can really optimize your knowledge and your strategy. And then if you need more medication, you know, 
that is totally necessary and you've, you you're doing what you can and it could also be maybe a stage in your life where you just need more medication and that's okay too so um Yes, that's why I really promote um, all the educators trying to promote our role because, yeah, there's there's so many different things you need to know about diabetes um, aside from just, you know, adding on more medication when maybe you, you could try something a little different. Gotcha. Like we always worry that potentially the new kid on the block in terms of the prescriptions, like that company might be giving doctors kickbacks or something like that. Have you ever seen anything like that over your time? This is really interesting. Um, there is, at least in the big hospital systems, that is not a thing. Because um, I, get, I get accused of that a lot if I am promoting like a certain medication. Um, they're like, well, you're getting paid. And I was like, no, I'm getting paid a really sad hourly wage. And same with the doctors. They're just like, we don't get, um, if anything, they can buy the doctor dinner, which could be nice. but. Um, I think too, like we really have no say in what we can prescribe either. So if a doctor was in bed with the Manjaro people, if your insurance doesn't cover it, they can't, you know, you can't get it. They can't prescribe it. So I think there's a lot that's let, I, that would be less of a worry to me that they're prescribing it for financial reasons. I think a lot of it just comes from them trying to follow an algorithm or them just trying to get the A1C down as quickly as possible. So they're like, let's use some heavy hitter medication. And sometimes that is warranted. And then sometimes, again, if we just saw a nutritionist or a diabetes educator, then we could maybe figure out some some different strategies to, to help just keep you on the medications you need. Gotcha. Well, you're kind of going back to the insurance thing and insurance not potentially covering. I know in our pre-talk before we recorded this, you talked about your time at a big nameless insurance company. Um, <laughs> what was your experience like that? I know you talking about it seemed pretty negative, but what were some of the things you saw in the belly of the beast that uh, maybe disillusioned you or disheartened you and made you frustrated with the system. Yeah. Okay. It was a dark time. <laughs> was, um, I think we often like, as people with diabetes or anybody who's chronically ill, we often wonder what those conversations look like and like why they don't have like clinical people in the room when they're discussing who gets what or what we cover. And I have been in the room and listened to those discussions and it is truly horrifying. Like, because it's a bunch of business majors making decisions. And again, you have, like we had diabetes educators that had been diabetes educators for like 20 to 30 years, like a long time. And they did not listen to them or consult with them really. And so that was kind of wild that like they had the resources to do that and we were in the room, but they just wouldn't listen to us. Um, and even if we were kind of speaking their language, we're like, well, this will help with the cost here and cut some things here. Um, the biggest issue is just this, this lack of like empathy and ethics. And again, that stigma that we all have or that a lot of people have about diabetes or chronic illness in general it really plays a part in the conversation of those oftentimes business majors that are running <laughs> insurance companies um, and making all of those clinical decisions. Um, I will say if there was any, like anything that was really dark and upsetting and ultimately why I had to leave because it was just horrifying to kind of listen to, it was a validating experience because I got to work in a way with doctors and with a bunch of different, like a multi-specialty approach. And because it was covered by insurance or by the employers, the clients were able to get like unlimited help. So they had a health coach, they had me that they could see weekly or however often they wanted. They could send us messages. They had a bunch of educational resources. And so it was like, this is exactly how it's supposed to look. And people's health outcomes really did. We were able to get people to lower medications, but also people that needed medications, we were able to put them on so that we could prevent even more costs down the road for that person and and the insurance company. Um, 
so it was very, um, that's kind of, it was validating to see what that looked like a, you know, non, because right now clinic is quantity over quality. And it was nice to see it switched and be like, oh, okay, <laughs> we, like, we can get everybody healthy. We just have to give. Yeah. <laughs> so I will say that was, that was nice um, to be able to do that and to see that that worked. No, it's good to hear. It's cool to see when it actually does work. You know, like there are pockets yeah. of insurance, whether it's employer insurance or in some cases, Medicare, where things just work smoothly. And you're like, this is possible. Mm -hmm. Anybody says it's not possible, 100% possible. And you got to stop doubting. Yeah. A couple more things. I guess the last thing I'd want to ask you is, you know, you've been in the belly of the beast as a diabetes educator, as someone who's worked in a hospital, as someone who's worked in his insurance, you know, Coming across the whole healthcare industry, what are some of the key changes you want to see in diabetic health, you know, I guess in any setting? Like, what are some key points you're looking to improve upon? Definitely. <laughs> just just got to get those, got to get those costs down, really. Um, and that's, that's always, you know, everybody points fingers at like whose fault it is, but it's always going to come down to the drug company. Because if we can get those costs down, then the insurance companies will cover more stuff, you know. Um, so it's not necessarily, while I am very pro universal, like no private health insurance, it could work a bit better if, if the costs were lower so that, you know, the, the insurance companies would be more likely to cover things because they're less expensive. Um, as well as then to like, I, I, people really need to have access to educators and nurses and even health coaches. Like I think, um, I talk a lot of smack about health coaches, but I think they have their place and they're very important, especially when you're living with a chronic illness that affects your life 24 seven, they, they can really help you problem solve through that. So that multidisciplinary approach and changing the way that we see clients in a clinic you know, instead of a 10 minute, 20 minute visit with your doctor, being able to to see them for a little bit longer and maybe see an educator afterwards, be able to see your podiatrist and your ophthalmologist in the same visit. There's actually a clinic in Atlanta that does that at Grady Hospital. So you get to see the doctor, the educator, you see a nurse, you see your podiatrist if you need to, and you see your case manager. And they're all there, which is great because that's, that's what you need in diabetes. So. <laughs> Because I'm thinking, even in my experience, when I've tried to see specialists, it's like, they're always booking yeah. like two to four months out. So it's like, okay, I'll see my endocrinologist in March, then I'll see my ophthalmologist mm -hmm. in July. And like, it just becomes this thing where they're not coordinating, yeah. you're barely even getting to see the doctor when you do get to see him. That's an amazing way to just kind of have the whole thing in one spot. Yes. It really takes because that like, I it didn't like really occur to me that this would be an issue, but I see like a million spe specialists and I have to use my PTO. So like, I don't go on vacation because I have to go to the doctor. So if we can get it kind of in one, obviously there's some other things we need to improve on, but I, I again would appreciate more of like a, that multi multi-specialty approach and, and just uh, making it more accessible and, and uh, focus a little bit more on the specialists and the education in, in diabetes world. That's awesome. All right, Rachel, well, this is all amazing information top to bottom. Really appreciate your time. If someone wants to get in touch with you, uh, you know, I know you have a bunch of stuff going on. So talk about your private practice, talk about your social media channels, YouTube channel, where everybody wants to find you, you know, we're happy to throw shameless plugs as much as we can, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so my website if you are interested in downloading some fun goodies, I just put out a Dollar General meal guide, which is exciting. So go over there. It's at Rachel, uh, sorry, give me some sugar <laughs> uh, dot coach, www.give me some sugar dot coach is the website. Um, and there's a bunch of good stuff on there, diabetes education wise, my blog. So I have some articles on there that might be helpful. Um, as well as if you are interested in working with an educator like me. And then um, if you are more of a, if you have an ADD like me and need a lot of like stimulating education, <laughs> that's on, you can go to Instagram or TikTok. And uh, on Instagram, I'm give me some sugar diabetes. And on TikTok, I'm give me some sugar beaties without the dia. So just beaties. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but all of that can be found on my website as well. But there's a lot of, you know, salty, uh, crazy shenanigans on social media as well to keep you stimulated and excited. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you have a YouTube channel too. Is that something you've been working on? I do. So I would, um, I don't have like a fancy website for it. So if you go again to my website, it'll link to the YouTube channel um, with some more long form. If you have a better attention span than me, you can sit through some, some longer videos. Um, so again, lots of different ways to learn. However, that that works for you. Um, yeah, lots of options. Awesome. Well, Rachel, this is amazing information top to bottom. I really appreciate your time. So thanks so much and hope to catch you again sometime soon. Thanks again for tuning in to Talking Retirement on YouTube. Please like and subscribe to keep up with the podcast and check out all the other great educational content we have on the NJ Life and Health YouTube channel. If you'd like to listen to an audio version of the podcast, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and pretty much all other major podcasting platforms. For daily senior tips and to keep up with us at NJ Life and Health, follow us on all major social media platforms such as Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at NJ Life and Health. And of course, if you'd like someone in your corner to help you with Medicare and life insurance, we would love to talk to you. Visit our website at www.njlifeandhealth.com or call our office in Toms River, New Jersey at 848-226-6897. We'd love to set you up with an appointment with one of our Medicare and life insurance brokers. And we are licensed in a lot of other states besides New Jersey. So no matter where you are, there's a chance we can help you out. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this podcast and we'll see you in the next episode.